So what inspired you to start a business focused on working with Gen Z? So I, was, um, I spent about 15 years of my um, initial part of my career in financial services. And, and I always said to myself that, you know, uh, when I returned back to India, I said, I will do just about anything, but run as far as I could from teaching, training, consulting, leadership, because uh, I'm, of, I had my dad, of course, who was in it and very uh, well-renowned and he traveled as much. But I just, somehow there was this um, thing in my mind that, okay, if you cannot succeed or else, is, this is what you do. But, you know, sometimes uh, the old saying, life is what happens to you uh, when you're busy planning what to do with it, right? And so I poured it into education in some way. And um, 2007, I really got a good opportunity to build leadership solutions for a company that I eventually had it. And in 2020, um, just uh, before COVID, um, I lost my father. So in 2020, immediately, I mean, there's a big vacuum in my life. And uh, I think there were uh, there was this gushing emotion to do something in honor of him. And so I think the first idea was to just write a book. And obviously, I hadn't written as much. So I took a course. I had written small articles. And so uh, one was the dedication to um, my parents. Uh, late parents, um, but also what can I write, which is a little more future thinking, future futuristic. Uh, so there's plenty written on uh, on Gen Gen Y and other generations and leadership books. I mean, there's plenty out there. And so I said that, okay, if I were to write something, what can I write, which could be more like a memoir for what I've seen? And that's how the journey began. And with absolutely no expectation that, you know, I'm going to try and build something from here. It was just uh, as we say, you know, something you sometimes you try small and you don't know where it leads you, right? And so that's how it began. And uh, so the book uh, slowly uh, grew, and I was getting a, a fair number of invitations to a talk on Gen Z. It was my first attempt, so I really looked at how does the Gen Z generation learn? Because I had two Gen Z boys at the time spending all their time on a device learning at the time, uh, thanks to COVID. And I also looked at, okay, what can companies do to onboard a young talent? And that was a big issue. Um, there was also um, every company was grappling with. And then, of course, the, the, the last piece of the book is talking about how can marketeers uh, look at Gen Z. So it was a little general book. Uh, I wish it wasn't uh, very specific because before I started writing, I saw that there was perhaps a book in each of these categories uh, by experts and largely written in the Western context. Um, and uh, before six months, I was invited by Ted again to give a talk on Gen Z. So I think it grew. And the more I started sort of kind of building on it, and I, I learned perhaps more after the book, not to say that I'm some deep expert, but I think the more clients were asking me, hey, can you do this? Can you think about this? What about this? Right. I, I think you, you uh, dove deeper. And what I found um uh, Ayush is that I think the the challenges and opportunities in a country like India where the, the demographics are so complex and so heterogeneous uh, uh, there were there was a room to play at four different buckets if you will where we could make an impact one was at the schools so a lot of the Gen Z population just by the age bracket right there's a large number which are in the school so India is a fairly young country right you've got uh, I don't know close to um, more than 40% of the population below the age of 30%. So that's a large number of people who are very young. So either it's Zen Zs or millennials or Zenelians, as they call it. So, so you have the school schooling system that where you can make an impact. You have the university system where you can make an impact. You obviously have the workplace where um, a fresh 21, 22 year old is just entering the workforce. And then you obviously have an impact that you can make at, uh, at home as a parent. And so uh, for each of these, the idea was that how do we take take um, take uh, training modules, take webinars, take master classes to uh, sensitize the educators in some cases, uh, to the professors in some cases, to the managers who are managing Gen Zs, right? And and that's how it began. And uh, you know, much of my work is in the space of uh, the corporate um landscape where a lot of the managers are kind of onboarding young gen z's but these are the four areas where i saw the uh, a huge amount of opportunity i think i think three of the four are untapped uh, but the fourth one is where i'm kind of putting some some of my energy yeah let's uh let's touch on that fourth one so what are the, some of the key insights you've gained about gen z's workplace behavior in corporate settings yeah so um again as um just to help our viewers and listeners um 
you know, there are five generations as per the experts uh, that are there, or or maybe even seven if you consider. So which are those generations? So there's the silent generation boomer, you have Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z. And then of course there's Gen Alpha, which is after Gen Z, and there's one preceding the silent generation, which is called the GI generation. Anyway, um, most of these have, in depending upon which research um, think tank you look at, uh, they will kind of categorize them depending on which years you're born, right? But largely it's defined by uh, a certain time where there were certain events everybody could relate to. And um, most companies today, um, I will likely have at least three generation in the workplace. So you're talking about Gen X, which is somewhere on the 39 to 55 age bracket. Okay, you got Gen Ys where so much is written uh, about them and they're probably in their 40s, the eldest of the uh, Y. And the Gen Z would be uh, between 1997 to 2012. So the, the eldest of the Gen Z is somewhere around 26 or so, right? Now, um, uh, each generation brings its context. And so uh, I think that drives the behavior and drives the opportunity as well as the challenge. So what I'm seeing is um, you got companies with minimum three generation, but in some instances you're seeing four generations at play, right? I mean, if you look at LinkedIn, more and more people are working longer. And so you see that each generation brings a different behavior at the workplace, right? So if you're a boomer, uh, uh, let's just look at uh, India as an example, like uh, people in that generation were just coming out of independence and India was gaining independence, fewer jobs, very low literacy and therefore their context was hey you know if we got a job hold on to it <laughs> and uh it doesn't matter uh you know just just uh just you know keep that job and and you know go through it uh gen x and gen y and gen z had a different context so uh but in terms of what we see at the workplace why this is important is that your foundational years have an impact on uh, your values, your beliefs, and that in turn have an impact on your behavior, which is what you bring to work. So if you look at the boomer generation, by and large, right, what's the what's the impression that people say, hey, they're uh, hardworking, they have a respect for hierarchy, uh, they really just want to be appreciated. If you think about the generation X, they're largely the generation which are the generation which is first generation, which is really seriously thinking about work balance, because that was the generation where more and more of the people in that bracket were actually doing global roles and working in multiple time zones. And, and you know, you had two, two uh, parents working at the same time and the kids were sort of alone. So I think the whole concept of work-life balance probably gained a little bit of main, mainstream recognition from that generation. Gen Y and Gen Z are the two generations where you saw again, uh, uh, that's the first generation which started putting uh, you know, themselves online. Uh, but what defined them? So if we compare the two generations, which are largely talked about Y and Z, is that okay? And uh, the Y generation uh, was very happy to reveal themselves online, right? They were uh, always wanting feedback. They wanted to be engaged, uh, and they wanted uh, a diversity in terms of their, um, uh, you know, workload and so on. If you look at the Gen Z, contrary to what a lot of people say that hey, there are lots and lots of similarities, I'd say there are some similarities, but there's still very distinctively different, right? So the Gen Z is different from the point of view that they're also equally tech savvy or more tech savvy, but they're tech savvy, but they also have a different view of the online now with um, cyber security and privacy and hacking and all the things that are happening, the dark side of the web, right? So you hear, you hear that. So they have a slightly different view of how they see their uh, digital footprint online. Uh, so that's one. They're much more entrepreneurial. Uh, there's enough stories. I mean, I see uh, certainly in the Indian context, you see that there's an aspiration to do something on your own uh, and so on. Uh, so again, that's just the context setting, I wish. Now, in terms of the behavior, what we see is that um, I always say each generation can learn from each other. So so um, when you think about the Gen Z there's a there's a stereotype for every generation, right? If you put, hey, which is the most narcissistic generation in Google, and you know you'll see everything from millennials, millennials will pop up, right? So likewise with with Gen Z, I I think a lot of the work that I've seen that again very adaptable generation, uh, they're very adaptable, obviously very tech savvy. Um, uh, that's a generation which is deeply passionate about uh, sustainability and and the climate crisis because. Uh, they're feeling it. They're actually feeling it. Other generations are feeling it, but they're saying that 
This is something that was handed to me. Uh, I wasn't part of this. And uh, so sustainability is another one. Inclusion is another one, uh, right? And I think mental health is also uh, something that matters to them, right? They are not shy, nor do they see that sort of as a taboo to say that, you know, I mean, I hear my son saying that, you know, maybe in his lifetime, the stress levels will get so much that you know, I may have to go and see a, a psychologist and then using them, what's wrong? And so I think I think they 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 appreciate and want to protect their mental um, health. Now, what can they learn from the other generations? I think the other generations they they can be a little more patient <laughs> because everything they want, you know, you know, a matter of seconds. Uh, so patience is one. Uh, also, when you, when I speak to managers who manage Gen Z, they always say that look use technology as a tool but not as a lifestyle so there's a distinction where you know you use a, a swanky app to you know um, you know do something online but do not be on that device for 14 hours or 12 hours or whatever that number that you know is out there but uh, so so make sure that there is that distinction uh, financial literacy is another one i would say that where <clears throat> there's a lot of debate about okay uh, they don't mind living in the now, living in the today, right? But there's also, uh, you know, a future to prepare for. So those are some of the, I would say that, you know, just just some sort of um, some attributes that A, to see the generations a little more um, sort of um, at a high level and as well as what each generation can learn from Gen Z, what Gen, Gen Z can learn from the other generations. I mean, there are so many threads to pull on. So <laughs> I want to, I want to, you know, bookmark this, but I, I, it's interesting that you wrote a book and you went down this pathway, but you also registered that there is not a lot of research. So how did you even make that decision? Was it just a drive from what happened with your family that pushed you to this direction? Was it the opportunity that you saw of, oh, there's not a lot of research. Let me contribute to that because it takes a lot of confidence and a lot of bravery to even touch <laughs> something that you know, a lot of people haven't realized or haven't been made aware of. Yes, absolutely. No, you're correct. Um, I was, it, certainly, there was absolutely no uh, long-term thinking gone to say that, hey, I will build, um, you know, a practice out of it, if you will, or something like that. But uh, I think the book was immediate, uh, uh, driven by uh, just simply to honor my parents. But the moment I decided to do that, and the emotions were so high at the point that I, 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 wouldn't have deferred it anymore. I would have, I mean, I just took it on. I spoke to as many people as I knew uh, from my past work and maybe 20 different people, practitioners, faculty, et cetera, from around the world that just say, hey, I'm thinking about this. And, uh, and uh, you know, what would you say? And I think um, I think the more I was listening to them, I was actually getting discouraged, to be honest, because I, I was experiencing my own sort of imposter syndrome about, <laughs> you know, how am I going to write something? There's so many experts out there and, and, you know, what do I know? And I think that's what I had taken a simple course, which, which was very well structured, which helped me to say that, look, it isn't about, if you're not going to make a kind of a well-researched um, quote unquote academic kind of a book, just look at your experiences. I think that will be much easier to write. And I think that became much easier for me. So, so I, I, I put down like, what are the things that we can share in every chapter? I just wanna share more stories uh, than give data and statistics because everything can be contested. And so so that was that. And as I said, uh, it grew slowly. I, I learned many things about the book business. <laughs> you have to eat, sleep and drink your book. But beyond that, I think I was just seeing that there was a lot of curiosity. People were enjoying it. People were happy about it. And uh, the TED Talk happened. That gained a lot of popularity. Uh, and then came the podcast, which, which was uh, honestly, I would say that I probably learned more from uh, others uh, on, uh, you know, then, then, you know, and people claiming that, hey, I am some expert, but where they brought their dimensions into looking at the various facets of Gen Z. Um, so here I am. I mean, uh, I see that this is a generation which is going to be talked about at the workforce for at least minimum seven, eight years, if not longer, and at least in the Asian context, because a very young demographic. In some societies, like uh, you have a slightly uh you know the curve is going the other way but uh but um so i see that and then hopefully we can just create enough value that 
end of the day, it's not about how big you make it, but it, I think you're you're touching and giving solutions to people and companies and clients, right? So uh, you're feeling good about that. And I, I want to make eye contact with something. Otherwise, I feel like it's going to dog the conversation. But when we say Gen Z, what demographic are we talking about? Gen Z in India? Are we talking about Gen Z in America? Just North American, like Western Gen Z? Yeah. Like, are there differences here? Are there, are, is it similar across the board? You're smiling, so I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. This is no, you're right. That's an excellent question. question. Uh, I, so I think, um, again, uh, the more I got to learn as I was asked to talk various dimensions, I think the deeper I I was forced to go and, and after the preliminary level of research I had done. So this whole notion of how generations were defined, again, it's come, it's a Western philosophy or a Western school of thought, which has been, and again, it's not wrong, but I think if you look at the term boomer, the boomer term is, is an American term, it doesn't even exist in some parts of the world, right? It's It came from the fact that there was the World War II and, you know, America was slowly getting back up on their feet and more uh, effluency was happening in families and therefore larger families. And that's how they got the term. But, you know, we've taken that and, and, and we kind of so, but the concept of generation remains true, which is to say that, yes, in, if, if we take certain number of years, if we look at the common events, can we all relate to that? Can we say that, hey, growing up, I was very uh, happy to watch that sitcom or I, we used to watch this or we used to do that, right? I think that remains. And what also remains is that those are the foundational years. And so every time, now, Ayush, if I'm given, to, uh, to, if I'm invited to give a talk and, and let's say if I'm doing a, an audience in to some part of Asia versus Africa versus India, that context really gets different, right? So I gave you the example of the boomer generation in India, which was actually very different than the boomer generation in America. <laughs> so uh, obviously um, uh, we, we've, to your question, the, the age uh, or the years have been kept same, 97 to 2012, roughly. But I think there is a local context which drives um, some of the um, some of what has happened. Now, overlaying, because of this generation, they're, they're so connected. The technology is the common denominator. They've all experienced, like I look at my son, my nephew, right, Dave, they know all the sitcoms that my cousins in America are watching. They know of all the tools. They know of all the sports, right? They know the sporting icon. So I think I think technology has bridged that gap. And many of the events, everybody today, because we're so connected, whether it's Black Lives Matter or the climate crisis or the energy crisis or the fake movement or the Me Too movement, right? Or the pandemic, right? Every single person was affected by the pandemic. So in some sense, there are some events which were global in nature, which apply sort of uh, to all Gen Zs. But then you're right, it is a little more uh, contextual and local. Right. So technology is the common denominator, which is a brilliant way to put it, because that kind of connects every Gen Z's experience being uh, in having technology within an arm's reach, using social media from a very young age. As you were saying, baby boomers, like the term technically only applies to folks in America, like it only makes sense, whereas in other parts of the world that maybe didn't win World War II and have an affluent family and country and have a lot of kids like that term doesn't make sense. Um, which is f fascinating. You just, again, as you were saying, podcasts teach you something. So taking this technology as a common denominator and applying that to the workplace, how does technology's effect and hold on Gen Z affect their workplace behavior? Sure. So a lot of the work, um, Ayush, that I do, again, when you think about um, training or leadership development work, right, I think there are I just take six, 60 seconds to kind of lay this out because it's important to then justify how technology can be utilized. So for example, in any leadership development program, we're essentially trying, there are four levels. The level one is when we do a program and you make an impact and you know how was that experience? You know, the, the trainer was good, the, the food was good, et cetera. Level two evaluation is where you can check with the participants to say, hey, do you now understand what was taught in the class? before and after and and so you can you can kind of do that through exams or you know things like that level three and level four in the uh consulting in the leadership space and in the training space are the hardest the, what's the level three level three is the shift in the behavior so i may have taught somebody hey you know how to manage difficult customers but does that mean that 
their behavior is going to shift when they go back to the job? Well, it, they may try, but it may take some time. So maybe six months from now, you know, they're becoming better. They're becoming more customer friendly. It may reduce the number of complaints. And that takes us to level four, which is basically that impact or the indicators that I have on the business. Now, why do I say this? I say this because technology is a great enabler uh, for all of us in this space at level two and level three, which is to say that what a Gen Z look um, like, don't give them a 40 page case study, right? Instead, like say that, okay, how can we give them short bite size assignments to check something post the class? Or how do we make sure that they remain engaged and they don't forget everything, uh, let's say six weeks out. And so that's where I would say that technology can be brilliant right so you use community tools like slack and uh, you know other tools where they they can form a community of their own you can use videos as a tool just as short videos for them to consume before after uh, as refresher and so on right uh and and i've seen companies uh just to give an example there is an erp company called sap you may be familiar with them right sap now sap what they've done is that they've kind of utilized some of these simple tools, technology tools, which are popular with Gen Z. So for example, TikTok, what they found out is that the Gen Z attention span, they don't want to read an annual report. They don't want to go and see and click, you know, 50 clicks to see, uh, you know, the website. Uh, instead, they're happy to see a tech TikTok video. So the senior leadership of that company basically created 40 uh, simple videos of two minutes each. Okay, telling what that company is about, telling the values of the company, telling the value proposition, and therefore uh, it immediately catches the Gen Z's attention, right? So I think there is a lot of positive in how we can use technology. I think in my space, I, in my work, I say that uh, it's an excellent way to um, use that as a support mechanism uh, to help make that change from level two to level three. And there you have the data, right? You can take some of that data and, and share it with the clients and say that, you know what? Well, we 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 simply made six connections already in advance. So you, there is no excuse to say that they won't show up or if, the fact that if they didn't show up, we can say that, look, we did our part, right? And that's how you can justify to the business saying, okay, what's the ROI on, on the investment that you're making? And, and I think so that's how you can use um, technology. See, immediately when you even go there, um, and I'll explain what I mean by that, but when you go to the place of, oh, we have to make TikToks to help Gen Z, or we have to turn this 40-page case study into more accessible, um, into, into a more accessible document in order to cater to Gen Z's attention span, I totally understand the argument <laughs> from older generations and the pushback of, guys, just like, we can't cater to you you cater to us you're the employees like you have to adapt and conform so is yeah. like how do we work with that dynamic of older generations want to be more traditional and more conservative not in the political way but you know what i mean yeah. i'm conservative and yeah. and how they do things but gen z are more I don't want to say tech oriented, but more progressive and I guess a little more stubborn to not adopt the old ways and to just do it the Gen Z way. You don't have to understand it. I'm just going to do it and I'm going to be successful <laughs> doing it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think uh, uh, you said it right, Irish, where I think the one of the ways in which I draw the distinction between Gen Y's and Gen Z's that I say Gen Y's accepted technology but Gen Z's expect technology, okay? So uh, that's the distinction. And I always say that there's a learning curve for the other generations uh, and there's enough stories by where, where some of these things, if they're not, um, I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if there's a way for us to kind of manage that, then you can avoid the conflict. Then you can even harness the power of multi-generations, right? And uh, I've seen where, uh, you know, the Gen Z is responding via text in the night and then someone doesn't respond, but responds via an email in the morning. So I think what works, uh, you know, recently in, last year I was invited in a, in a conference where I had to speak on the hybrid way of working. And, and I think what companies have realized is that it's best to have, uh, I think, a simple uh, kind of a communication guideline, if you will, where uh, we can say that, okay, you know what, if it's a client kind of communication, Let's be professional and shall we do it in an email versus a voice note. 
Although in Asia, I must say that I think, I mean, today business is done on WhatsApp and it's just the way things have gone. I don't see my son even like when he gets to gets on a call with his friends, he, he doesn't even, they don't even take the time to write WhatsApp messages. It's all about voice notes. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I think the more advanced the technology becomes, I think they're, the positive is that they're actually learning it and leveraging it the most. Uh, but that does bring a gap among the other uh, generations, right? And I think it's a two-way thing that I think we have to say that, you know, look, if can the Gen Z appreciate the other generation's context, can we on this side help them kind of move upstream, if you will? And uh, for the most part, um, and, but, but companies, you're right, companies do have to keep this in mind. There is a, I want to use the word, but there's a huge turnoff for Gen Zs where they see that if a company is a technology dinosaur, that's just, they have turned them off. They, they feel like, okay, you know what? <laughs> I don't think I can survive this long. And um, uh, so, so I think there is a learning on both sides. Uh, anyway, yeah. So I want to turn this question on its head because if I'm an older, if I'm part of an older generation and I see this, let's, let's call it for what it is a proclivity for Generation Z to kind of take advantage of the non-tech savviness of older generations. Uh, we talk about companies being tech dinosaurs, um, which turns Gen Z off. But as soon as I feel like Gen Z come into company cultures, and please correct me if I'm wrong, they kind of take it over. Not as <laughs> like not as like a malignant cancer cell. I'm part of that generation, so I don't want to speak badly about you know my people. But it's like, Again, we are very stubborn and I don't really care if you understand why I'm marketing in this way. I'm just going to do it this way <laughs> and you're going to accept it, right? So how do how would you recommend Gen Z kind of deal with the you know, inability for older generations to, you know, adopt this expect technology attitude? Because again, as we all know, as you know, Gen Z grew up in technology, whereas other generations adopted it. And so our yeah. minds, our ability to understand technology, right. where we expect yeah. it, you know, yeah. is very different. Uh, no, you know, it's, absolutely. It's... And so you're right. I think there has there's a kind of a ripple effect, if you will. And I, I really <laughs> have to acknowledge and admire your uh, your candidness and self-awareness uh, of, of being, being self-critical of your generation in a good way, right? Not in a bad way. Uh, about the, the downside of too much technology or a device, right? We've seen enough. I mean, there's enough out there that says that, you know, the get away from being FOMO to JOMO, right? The fear of missing out to joy of missing out, right? And, uh, you know, there are these detox camps and whatnot. So I think, I think Gen Z is also kind of uh, getting a taste of their own medicine in some ways because you're overdoing some of that. But uh, one of the ways, um, uh, Ayush, that, uh, that I do couple of things in at, at workshops in uh, and and I ask companies to do it even afterwards is that um, we do an exercise called the assumptions audit and so the assumptions audit is essentially saying that okay you know if you and I are working together we're in different generations you may uh, see a particular behavior of me uh, at one point uh, and then you just wonder like what why is he doing this and I may see something of you right uh, and 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 rather than reacting at the time what the teams are asked to do is that okay can they come this is intact teams they will work together right so some some frequency that they feel which would work for them they would come back and then then kind of just share to say that okay um so let's say for example i will say that you know what um uh, or let's say you're you're making a, a, a remark on me saying that i think you uh because you're senior in the room you're quick to dismiss the younger people in the room now you're just saying the observation you're not telling me it's interpretation you're not telling me you're not extrapolating that to say that you know maybe because i have too much technology on my hands and you think therefore i don't have uh, much to think about or whatever right that would be the interpretation right and for example um i could come back to you and say that you know Ayush, um like i see like uh, a, a whole lot of the people in the room are not inviting some of the more experienced people because when it comes to innovation, you don't want us in the room. That's an observation. So you can share that observation. Now, if 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 you interpret it as saying that, you know what, he's on the other side, like what ideas is he going to bring? 
And that, that would be the, that would be the uh, justification. So what we do through that is that we ask each generation or each team with a diverse group of uh, sort of demographics to look at that and then have a conversation to say that, okay, what, you know, and maybe, maybe bring that out and say that, okay, in this situation, what was going on in your head, right? Well, what was the remark about? And I think that helps us to uh, bring, um, you know, some of these stereotypes or some of these, uh, you know, things that you're talking about and technology being one of them. Like I've seen a lot of times where, um, where someone is talking and, you know, you're on a device, like, so the immediate reaction would be, you know, why is he being disrespectful? Or is he like not respecting what I'm saying? Am I not uh, making sense? Or am I boring? Whatever it is. It could be that, that like maybe he's taking notes on the device, right? So I think we, we can carry assumptions both ways. And so I think we use exercises like that um, where uh, we try and bridge that. Another one very quickly I use is also what I call describe, evaluate, describe, interpret, evaluate. So I just tell them to describe a situation, interpret the situation, right? So let's say, you know, you, you have a situation, you interpret it. But then I ask you, you have to come up with an alternative evaluation. So you only tell me like, okay, what else could this, how else could we have solved this? In this situation, you know, you're pointing the finger that this went wrong, but what's the alternative to that? So you're then being forced to put into the other person's shoe and see from their lens, if that makes sense, right? So again, the, the, this, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process, mm -hmm. uh, right? And uh, I think the more we can, uh, we can harness some of that, uh, it, it just brings, I think there's, there is, there's a lot of positive in my view, but yeah, we have to be patient on both sides and, uh, and, and kind of see how we can bridge this gap. So if we were to extrapolate the trends that are going on now and look to the next two to five to 10 years, what are some of the things that will happen in regards to Gen Z moving up in the corporate world, Gen Z moving up in academia, um, Gen Z interacting with you know, other generations as well, becoming more ingrained in their careers? Do you see, is it more positive? Is it more negative? Is it all just interesting? <laughs> well, uh, no, it, I look, I think uh, I think there is uh, always a school of thought, you know, what's kind of the doomsday. Oh, my gosh, this, you know, that, that's what they said about uh, 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 narcissists of, of Gen Y's being so narcissistic, right? Which is saying, that, oh, they're so self-centered. A lot of times what tends to happen is that what I call is that there are meta stereotypes of each one of us, which is almost to say that the popular belief about what exists about that generation or of that individual tends to drive the behavior than the reality, <laughs> right? Which is, which means that, uh, you know, in reality, perhaps um, it's, it's not, I mean, look, when we grew up, we had our parents from different generation. You have parents from a different generation. I have, so it, it still worked out, right? I think, uh, I think it all worked out. And uh, some of these, phases of life, like when you're a teenager, uh, when you're in an adulthood, right? They're, they're common across, right? Everybody wanted to be a little bit rebellious and they want to try new things and, and do things. They, they did something stupid, wanted to hide it from parents. So, so there is that. So I don't, I don't think it's a lot of gloom and doom. And I think um, same thing with Gen Ys where uh, all the hype about Gen Ys that it's going to completely change the working landscape. I almost see that, you know, the Gen, the Gen Ys are not saying that about Gen Z, saying, you know, we were the more mature one and we were the more settled ones. And, you know, I, you know, forget about, you know, people criticizing us, look what's ahead. So I always think that, you know, that chain will likely continue. I think the Gen Z may feel that, you know, we were given a hand, but, you know, I mean, like you, you are going to step on the pedal even more with technology. Imagine the Gen Alpha coming out in 10 years. I mean, you know, just today I was watching how chat GPT is now, you can talk to it and, and it solves the problem, right? So, you know, where will that lead? But I think it, things have a way to work out, right? So a lot of it is, um, you know, it's context driven. We will see that the values um, will be shaped by that. And, uh, and I think that only means that as the world becomes more volatile, like the, the, the stuff about pandemic, the stuff about cri uh, climate crisis, the stuff about other things that we kept hearing prior to the last three, four years are happening now. So this generation has a real 
a real legit reason to say that you know what this this can extrapolate so so i think a lot of our own context drives some of that so i don't think it's gloom and doom i think every generation has its kind of time uh, and place and maturity and where they see it and and they know that look it's their turn now <laughs> to right. harness someone underneath them right Okay, so let's make the conversation a little more gloom and doom since we're, we're all happy, <laughs> happy right now. So w one of the reasons, and I'll push back a little bit, simply because right now we're, we're undergoing massive political polarization yeah. um, all across the world. Many wars are being fought. Um, you know, our addiction to social media and to other substances is at an all-time high. Depression is at an all-time high. Um, and even even you know environmental collapses of you know carbon in the atmosphere, ocean acidification, coral die-offs, antibiotic resistance. You know the list literally goes on, unfortunately. And so yeah. this didn't exist wholesale for other generations, yeah. right? And I, I don't mean that in a, like a Gen Z complaining attitude, um, yeah. or in, in just a. I'm just stating it matter of factly. You know, obviously baby boomers were coming off of a world war and wars were being fought. The Cold War was was at an all time high with other generations, but the massive compounding um, list of of global dire circumstances was never this um, this this present. And I'm not just asking this from a stress point of view, but for any Gen Z, it's like. How do you even begin to focus on your career to try to get work done if like the future seems so bleak? You know, mm -hmm. it, 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 I, I guess my question is, like, how, do, how do we grapple with this, you know, global circumstance and then apply it to the workplace? Do, do workplaces have to talk about, you know, sustainability and social responsibility every day? Do they have to make that really clear for Gen Z? Does Gen Z have to be more more adamant in the workplace of solving these problems like are these are these trends that you're seeing yeah no absolutely you're uh, look it's a i think it's a pretty good sort of devil's advocate view on the other side and i would say that look that there, that there is there is there is there is truth to i mean a lot of what you're saying in the sense that we're, we're all it's all out there for us to see right we don't have to you know you know dig into a go into a library for it like we just see it every day morning to evening and um and and so uh what i am seeing is that yeah it's as simon sinek says in one of these videos like i think the workplace and the personal lives have the lines for them are blurred and therefore like um uh, you know, work has entered into homes and, and we don't know like what is home because you could be dialing it for wherever and, and, and what is workplace. So I think this whole this whole thing about you could be connected, you could be, I mean, it 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 has taken a toll and and I absolutely agree. Um Ayush, I think um there's there is there is sufficient evidence. I know people who are in sort of the counseling space and you know psychotherapists and things like that. And they're saying that, you know, some of the younger generation, and, and again, just I'm using, we're talking about Gen Z, that they've lost the ability to even socialize. Like they feel stressed about meeting people. I mean, it sounds very bad, but 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 that's just what you know, it has come to. And therefore, even the importance of, as you say, of building relationships. So, I mean, if, if you compare, I'm sure like maybe, you know, you look at your parents or someone like, you know, I remember my father would always call up people just to chat hey what's going on and I tell my brother that you know we have the best devices like how often do we talk and I know that my father used to always talk to his brother like I'm not making this up but every single day like the the younger uncle from America would call to his elder brother so I think I think relationships stay taken a back seat uh, stress has entered the life in 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 ways in which we we haven't been able to uh, kind of manage uh, so it's they've become the the generation has become much more fragile uh, in, in that sense, and uh, I I think um, as as Seneca said in one of his that I think that emotional presence is required. So it you know he talks about like if you're having a bad day, then you just sort of you know you're sitting and and showing that to your boss, which is not expected, <laughs> but that's a function of what he or she is going through, right? And and uh, so whether right or wrong, good or bad, that's just the context. And so I, what I say to the managers is that let's appreciate 
I mean, let's be mindful of what they're doing, right? How can we help in them in that situation rather than being critical? I think they've just been handed a, a set of cards, uh, right or wrong, right? And, and they've been handed a set of cards, like what can be the manager's role, the boss's role? And so I think, for example, um, sustainability, I've known companies who, who, who go out and, and try and get people who are deeply passionate about the environment, the earth, and they just invest because they want to make a good name. And they actually, their focus is only on Gen Zs. I don't think they can sell that story to a Gen X or saying, hey, what, you know, would you want to, you know, kind of do something? I mean, they'll do it, but Gen Z is saying like, look, I really want to do something, right? Um, I think inclusion. And inclusion is another place where I see that uh, managers being very, very sort of sensitive about, uh, you know, how can we, how can we kind of keep that in mind? Things like reverse mentoring, things like shadow boards, uh, all of that is happening as a way to engage and support the Gen Z. And, and, and more companies are making really honest attempts uh, where reverse mentoring is working. So you find out what's inspiring them. Uh, so there is, there is, um, uh, you're right, uh, I think, I think, I mean, at prime of Pacey, when we look at everything is, <laughs> as they say, uh, you know, in the Mahabharata, that, that the Kali of the bad times are at the end and, and only the Lord can save us. But uh, look, I think, I think we, we've managed and therefore uh, I have a sense of optimism in the sense that, yes, uh, it, it won't be easy. Uh, as as my my son often says, you know what? In my lifetime, I've seen my friends, or I'll see my friends getting divorced, uh, not once but more, and they're quite okay with that, <laughs> and and they're quite matter of factly saying that you know what? It it will just happen, which was in the early generation thinking you it's a sacred thing. How can that ever happen? But I think that the the level of tolerance, as you say, the level of tolerance has shrunk, right? And so what it means is that how can we help that generation be a bit more resilient? How can we help them to be uh, create a bit more safe space for them? And uh, how do we remove the barriers? Uh, uh, and, and I think that just requires good leadership, Ayush. I totally believe that. I think there are enough stories where uh, if, if you can just do that, I think there is so much to harness. And I just feel that um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's more positive that can come out of it. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but I still came back. <laughs> no, no, it, it answers it and more. Um, I, two wild cards are influencing and Gen Alpha, and I guess I'll touch influencing first. I think this is one of the biggest, strangest occupations that Gen Z and some millennials actually partake in. It's already being automated by artificial intelligence, so I really don't know how long it's going to last. But have you come across any research, any interesting facts about businesses engaging with influencers about Gen Z's proclivity? I know that the generation um, ranks this job as the number one thing to do, <laughs> which is horrifying, um, but also kind of speaks to their psychology. So like, how do we deal with the, this influencing culture and where should we go from here? Yeah, no, excellent point, uh, excellent question, Arish. So look, I think I think the the marketeers are sort of in a dilemma in the sense that okay, how do you to think that okay, this is a generation, you know, their behavior patterns, consumer behavior patterns haven't emerged. They they've emerged, and I think what are the ways in which we do it? So, uh, you look at um, um, Gen Gen Ys were the first ones who were always the ones who were saying like, okay, they want to look at brand recommendation, they will look at reviews and things like that. And so it's kind of built from there. But this whole influencing culture has gone to 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 the level where like, uh, uh, you know, where uh, it, it as far if I'm a company, I'm I'm thinking that okay, it's best for me to get like a, a top cricketer in India, and and if he's got ninety million followers like you know who better to kind of push my product right and it's very could could be a it could be that he or she may not ever use the product now that's the side that i think as you say uh is is the danger and um, uh, what i say is that uh, for the gen z the influencer the microblogging all of that um uh, is 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 making sense because they can relate to the user generated content by the celebrity or the influencer, right? And they can relate to that. And that that is how they see that, okay, if it makes sense to them, then maybe I, I can see how I get, um, 
and you know, I get attracted to that brand. But I also say uh, just as much, perhaps more for that generation than anyone else is, is the need to do the homework and the critical thinking, right? Because we're living in a time, Ayush, where there is, I mean, such massive amount of data coming in every nanosecond of our life. Like, I mean, you know, you know, so what, how, how do you grapple with that, right? I mean, for every good story, there is a data that says, you know, oh, but uh, this is, uh, for, just for example, I mean, we had, there's a, there's a, there's a brand called Born Vita in India, which was a very popular drink uh, growing up, and it's actually a Cadbury product. Uh, for the longest time, they were, they were uh, pushed by a lot of celebrities, and all of a sudden now, uh, they've come under the scanner because of the amount of sugar that they, Kind of said that it was versus what really was and and therefore now all of a sudden i'm saying to myself well that's bad because we all fell prey for it but what happened to the people who were endorsing it and also the people who followed them <laughs> right and i think that's kind of what you're saying is that the influencing culture has has gone to the level where uh i i always say you know pause do the homework i think gen z is right in their fair ask of saying that yeah i want my experience to be unique i want my experience to be convenient right i think that's pretty fair to ask uh, i want my experience to be consistent right and uh, and uh, and uh, you know i think as long as that happens so uh, you know for instance if, if, if you travel in a train like back in the day i was, uh, the, the train service was india has a very good train connectivity but they've really modernized the train. So for example, if you're in a train and, and if you see that, hey, there's some dirt on your seat or something is not dirty, something is not clean, you can actually tweet. And within 30 seconds, there's gonna be a reply back saying that, hey, by the time you reach the next station, someone's gonna come and clean that. Now, that kind of an experience will actually attract a Gen Z to a train journey, right? Uh, because they're they're seeing immediate um, kind of response to that. So. I think there is a lot of uh, basic expectations that brands have to cater to, like convenience, like the first uh, um, the authenticity, uh, all of that. But I also say that be careful, be in doing the homework. And and uh, and just because you have X number of followers, right? And, and this, the downside again, uh, Irish, is that uh, unlike other media, digital, I mean, if you look at traditional form of media, in the digital media, right, you don't, how does one correct themselves? They just go back and forth. There's more trolling. There's more defending. There's more trolling. There's more defending. What what next after that, right? That doesn't solve my problem, right? And so, so I think the critical thinking here is 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 maybe the obvious thing to say, but I think we're living under massive amounts of data and and uh, how information gets fed to us. So I think that's the one thing I would say uh, we must do our homework there <laughs> across generations. So we talked before about these meta stereotypes, which kind of self enforce, reinforce um, the behavior of culture. So when looking to Gen Alpha, how, how do we, there has to be some balance in doing some research, extrapolating from data, but also kind of not corrupting them before they've had a chance to experience <laughs> culture by themselves. Do you see any that's a bad question, but do you see any potential for Gen Alpha to make a difference? Because uh, the reason I say it like that is because, you know, they experienced COVID at three. Yeah. You, you know, it's like they they were given, if Gen Z want to complain about being handed, you know, the, the, the deck of bad cards, like look at Gen Alpha. They weren't even handed the deck. They, they were, they're not even playing the game. <laughs> right. How should we how should we be thinking of Gen Alpha? Should we be worried? Is there an opportunity um, yeah. to, to to teach the generation? <laughs> no, excellent question, and I think uh, I think I wish uh, that's squarely something the Gen Z generation will have to deal with and 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 take more. And and I seen I say this kind of just in fun, but I mean I say this in the context that if you look at the the work demographic, like if you're an Xer, right, you are probably a fifteen year runway ahead of you. If you're a millennial, you probably got a 20, 25 year runway ahead of you. So if I'm in a meeting today, I'm likely seeing X, Y, and Z. But if you fast forward that out even 10 more years, right? Who are the people who are going to be in the room? It's going to be Y, Z, and then Alpha. 
And then you're getting to a stage in 10 years or 15 years, right, where the millennials are sort of saying that, okay, you know, our time has come. They could extend that runway, but I'm saying what the the two generations, which will closely will have to work, right? It's it's sort of like the Y and the Z now, the Z and the L, right? <laughs> so can the Z, can the Z generation appreciate the context of what 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 what's forthcoming for uh, forthcoming for the alpha generation? But again, look, I I say that with time, a lot of the work that I do, I with um, senior leaders, I see that it is also about you know sort of. Uh, how do I say? Uh, well, so I do. We do a very, really good activity called the River of Life, where we talk about okay, you tell me all the critical milestones of your life and what leadership lessons did you learn, and and it could be your mom or dad or whoever from from childhood to the professional uh, working years, and uh, and I always say that okay, you could be forty five, and then can you tell what does the river look like from here onwards? Which means that how do you want your legacy to be? And so I think that's where most people are caught off guard. And I also ask when we're doing this to say that, would you think that someone else will have your name as part of their river of life? Mm. Does that make sense? So would you, let me just repeat, would you think that you would feature on someone else's river? And I think as Gen Z becomes into middle managers and senior manager roles, I think there will be that, form of leadership coming into them and to say that in other words you know here's a group of generation which is unique they have the technology um history with them right but i also say that as you see you know them leading more teams working more and more with you know different generations you know when you think about late 20s to 30s and so on right there is also an element of how can they create a leadership shadow in other words, what can they do which will impact the next generation? So in many ways, it comes down to that. But you're right, uh, it won't be easy. <laughs> as, as if I ask my uncle or if I ask uh, someone from uh, you know, my elder generation, they say that, you know what, I'm glad I won't be even around. I don't know, that's your battle. <laughs> you fight that battle. Um, but, uh, you know, jokes aside, I think, uh, I, I think, uh, I think it will be a lot of hard work. Uh, uh, and and uh, But again, um, I always say that it, it should work out. It would work out. <laughs> so I guess what, one of the most important and last questions, but how, what advice do you have for Gen Z to assume these leadership positions, not occupationally, but I guess culturally, um, socially, and societally? How, how yeah. do we, Ex as, as young people, think about leadership? What is leadership to you? How do we, um, yeah, just just... How do we assume leadership positions without corrupting ourselves and other generations as well? Absolutely, no, fantastic. Uh, look, I think I think oftentimes I, we get we confine ourselves to really uh, limit the definition of leadership, right? And 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 therefore I always say I go back to that example I gave you a minute ago, right? Some of our most life transforming lessons may not have come from you know, that professor from an Ivy League school. And again, no disrespect to the professor or the school or anything, right? I mean, we we probably, if we were lucky enough to go or we've gone, we would have grown and you would have done well in life. But I'm saying that I think the simple way to think about leadership is that you're impacting someone at, at all times. And I was very struck by a statement. Again, I just was very happy for my son to say that because if you look at a country like India or some of our Asian countries, right, where... Um, you know, there is the demographics story is so complex and you see the extreme rich, the rich and then you see the middle class, the poor. But, you know, one of the things that he said is that, you know, dad, um, you always remember that someone else is living your dream. In other words, you may complain about that, you know, I wish I was there. I wish I could do that. I wish I had so much more in my bank balance. And therefore, he's saying that. So there's always someone, <laughs> you know, you're very fortunate to have so much that you have, right? So I think in many ways, um, I find, I think, I think for the simplest way for the Gen Z to say that, look, it, you don't need a title. You don't need to be called an SVP or someone, right? You're making an impact already as a leader, whether it's environment, whether it is, um, uh, you know, inclusion, whether it is anything else, right? I think, I think, what can be compounded is that if you can get a good mentor who who sees that in you, right, and nurtures that, 
And to me, that is is probably uh, you know you know what we want to create more of: good mentors, good leaders who can create more leaders, right? And uh, but two other things I will say, just Irish as a way to close out, is that I think the way the world is going in terms of you know you asked that question about the doomsday and all of that, right? I think I, I think the world, the way the world is going, the two very essential competencies which are going to be very very uh, important for every generation, but also for uh, Gen Z, is the first one is learning agility. In other words, they will have to quickly unlearn a lot of what they've learned, as are the other generations are doing. And I think they've been put through like, um, you know, a Mack truck over them, right? Because there's so much that has happened over just the four years. Like, you know, I mean, so where do you do it? But I think, I think, the more resilient and emotionally strong they can become and can be self-aware that, look, the more I can be agile in learning. So in other words, you have the question about alpha, right? They may need to unlearn many things of their life. I don't know. I mean, 15 years from now uh, and, 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 and adapt themselves to, to, uh, to, uh, to lead Gen Alpha. So I think learning agility is going to be a very crucial um, competency, in my view, which is which is going to drive that, and COVID taught us that, right? And because we could we could say that, hey, I could be the best pharma pharmaceutical student, but that doesn't solve the problem. I have to still think about how am I going to price the vaccine. I have to think about how am I going to ship it, who's going to get it, what's the communication strategy. So I think more and more people will have to look at problems from different dimensions. So learning agility is something where this is where I also say the Gen Z will have to be careful in not become impatient because learning agility requires you to go back a bit before you go forward <laughs> and that can be very frustrating because you can quickly say that you know what i, I think i'm going to give up but that's where you let go of the learning curve that could potentially be coming into you so the learning agility is one and second i would say is curiosity i think uh um with so much gadgets and so much technology and so much being kind of uh, brought to them, uh, we just want that every generation, but even the Gen Z generation, that they don't lose this part to kind of, kind of, kind of, you know, be curious about life, curious about, <laughs> you know, wh why this is happening. And so those are the two, in my view, and there are more, but these are two very essential competencies, which, which I think every Gen Z should, every generation, right, they should try and um, work towards. Yeah, and it's important for someone like yourself to not only acknowledge these, but also make us aware of them, because it's better for us to find out about them now and then work to implement them in our careers and lives down the line, rather than finding out down the line and figure out how to rework it into our careers and lives. Um, but Nikhil, this has been just an absurdly detailed and great conversation. I think we've only scratched the surface, so we'll have to do a part two on this. But where can we <laughs> find you online? Yeah, so uh, you can, uh, again, uh, I'm not on too many of the platforms, but the one that I am very regular or active is LinkedIn. So you can simply look me up on LinkedIn. Of course, there is a website there as well. It's learnwisely.in, which is where you can find the work that I do. Uh, you can find chapters of my book. You can find information about the podcast. The podcast is uh, called Working with Gen Z, and that's available on all the platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google. So uh, go check it out. But uh, more than anything, look, I I, I say I'm, I'm a curious learner. So I wish what's next is I'm going to learn from you. We'll, we'll have to plan for that. We'll do that next. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Nikhil, thank you so much for this conversation. Hope to see you soon. Okay, take care. Bye.